Hi, this is Dr. Diane Gayhart, and this is my lecture on cognitive behavioral and mindfulness-based couple and family therapies. And so this goes with my textbooks, my family therapy textbooks, uh, The Mastering Competencies in Family Therapy, as well as Theory and Treatment Planning in Family Therapy. And you can uh, find more resources on these uh, two websites, themasteringcompetencies.com, which has a lot of resources that go with the book, as well as my personal website. So cognitive behavioral family therapy is obviously closely related to more traditional cognitive and behavioral therapies. And similar to the traditional approaches, there are family-based approaches that are more behavioral. Some can be more cognitive. And obviously, there tends to be a combination thereof. What's different in the family approaches is that they, uh, a layer of systems analysis is used to uh, analyze the problem behaviors and interactions. And so just like the more systemic approaches used to work with couples and families where we analyze the uh, uh, systemic interaction patterns, the uh, cognitive behavioral family therapists do this very similar things, do the same type of analysis of an interaction pattern, but using behavioral analysis and uh, something very specific to their approach is called functional analysis that we'll talk about. So there are some more behavioral couple family therapies or more, some more cognitive behavioral forms. You'll, we'll also talk briefly about Gottman's uh, couples therapy, which is very popular, and I do go into some detail in my books about this. There are also new mindfulness-informed and mindfulness-based couple and family approaches, as well as several evidence-based treatments, including integrated behavioral couples therapy, as well as functional fam family therapy, which I do have an entire uh, full section on and another uh, online lecture on functional th family therapy. So you can check that one out if you are interested. It is a phenomenal approach for working with conduct disordered, substance abusing adolescents, and it, it really is a very elegant evidence-based treatment approach. The Juice, uh, Significant Contributions to the Field by CBFT. So the one thing I think that is probably the most widely used element of CBFT is parent training. And I have certainly seen that therapists who may work from a variety of other approaches when it comes to actually helping parents uh, learn about parenting, many people will go back to the basic principles of CBFT. And some, and we'll go again into some further detail within, in the intervention sections in terms of how to do this. But when working with parents, especially with younger children, there are some key principles at looking at the reinforcement, whether you know parents are using positive or negative reinforcement to shape the child's behavior, and then looking at consistency. And so, as we all know, uh, consistent reinforcement is one of the fastest ways to um, change beha behavior, specifically negative behavior. And so these are some of the key principles in, in parent training. And so, and in, in also as part of the parent training, they're trying to teach, I mean, the idea here is not just to have your, the children be, you know, little robots who follow every little command. Obviously, that actually isn't good parenting. It's very convenient when you're a parent in a grocery store or restaurant, but that's actually not the purpose. And the purpose of, you know, behavior parent training is to help parents to um, teach their children, you know, how to make good decisions, how to behave appropriately you know, independently is the goal. And so you um, work uh, on helping parents how to effectively teach children to be, you know, compliant, follow the rules, as well as to interact socially with others. And so oftentimes what you're doing with parents is helping them in improve the way that they request this behavior and reinforce it uh, in the children. They also teach monitoring and tracking. It is amazing. Um, if you are in a busy family, maybe this isn't so amazing to you, but to actually monitor and track children's behavior and to accurately keep track of how often you know the problem behavior occurs can actually be challenging and difficult, especially if it's a household with more than one child. And so the therapist will also work with the parents on using monitoring and tracking of the behavior, not just to get a baseline of you know how frequent the behaviors are, how severe, how often. Um, but also to look at all the consequences and eventually to even help in shaping uh, behaviors in positive ways, which moves on to um, can creating a contingent environment. So helping the parents set up, and I think it's real important to set up a very easily implemented 
program for, you know, uh, contingent, a contingent environment for the children where if they cooperate, they are, you know, rewarded with, you know, more privileges. And if they, you know, are not cooperative or not appropriate in their behavior, they lose, you know. And so that's kind of um, some, you know, there's some of the basic focus of the parent training. The last thing here is this five minute work chore. So finding, it's amazing. I think one of the places a lot of parents get off track in terms of uh, reinforcing children's behaviors, they often make the behavior, the consequences way too big. I guess the two, you know, they make the consequences way too big and too frequent and too often. So you begin to lose leverage um, or they're inconsistent. I mean, that's the other favorite way to go wrong. And so the five minute work chore is introduced as a very simple, small consequence um, that the children can have that's easily enforceable. It's not um, over the top and doesn't take a ton of effort on the parent to make it happen. You know, for example, sometimes I have, you know, parents who want to, you know, I'm going to take away the TV or whatever it is. And, you know, but if the TV is two rooms away from where you're cooking dinner and you've got three kids and one of them, you know, TV has been taken away either for one of them or all of them, whatever it is, you can't monitor that. That's like a very, uh, it's a setup for uh, disaster in terms of parenting or something like the five minute work chore where you can have them do something very quick. I even tell my parents, you know, take away nowadays, it's, you know, taking away the cell phone is, you know, usually the worst thing you can do to a teen who has a phone, you know, taking it away for even, you know, depending on the age of the child, 10, 30 minutes, an hour. It's small, but if you do it consistently, you definitely get their attention and they understand. And obviously there needs to be enough, it needs to be time so that there's enough of a sense of loss, but not over the top where they give up hope and, you know, have developed this learned helplessness. So yeah, take away my phone, take away my TV, take away the car. I don't care. You know, take away my, you know, play dates, whatever it is, depending on the age of the child. So there's a real art to parenting and, um, learning how to set that uh, consequence to be appropriate and typically less is consistent and smaller is better than trying to have huge ones that are you know extreme and either you know inconsistently uh, reinforced. So now I want to move on and just give you the big picture kind of overview of how treatment progresses in CBFT. So very similar to the CBT approaches, CBFT has these basic four di different steps. And this approach, can, more than any other, does seem to be quite linear um, and direct. So you begin with a very detailed assessment of the problem behavior and or cognitions. And then um, once those are clearly identified and assessed, then you move on to targeting the specific behaviors and or thoughts for change. There's often a significant process of education, followed by replacing and retraining and um, those behaviors. And basically, you know, what this really looks like in process is you often go back and forth, you know, may cycle through these a few times and until, you know, the behavior is extinguished and replaced with more desirable ones. And so it's a very simple kind of straightforward problem solving sort of approach. So next I want to move on to talking about the therapeutic relationship in CBFT, which has certainly evolved over the years. So in CBFT, similar to, you know, traditional CBTs, that the therapist is definitely much more of a directive educator and an expert. And so the, the therapist pretty much is responsible for assessing and educating the clients on how better to handle those problems. It's an expert position, which again is relatively rare in the um, family therapy world. Increasingly in recent years, I'd say the last 20, 30 years or so, empathy has much more directly been used in, EB, in uh, CBT, CBFT. And in the very beginning when CBT was developing side by side with psychodynamic and humanism, uh, there was less much, they were like, we don't do the empathy as a way of really distinguishing themselves from the other two approaches. But over the years and based on research and CBT is very much a research driven approach. You know, it's probably a very, it has grown out of the research that we do have. So empathy is definitely incorporated much more into contemporary forms 
of uh, CBFT, and it's emphasized as part of the using it to create the the alliance. And so, and it's also a much more collaborative approach where client perspectives are considered, and, and it has become more flexible over the years. Now, all of that said, it's important to understand that in cognitive behavioral therapy, empathy is used to build rapport, to get buy-in from the client, to trust the therapist who is still the educator and the expert in terms of what needs to happen. And there can be some collaboration back and forth, but the but this is in dramatic contrast to let's say Carl Rogers' approach where empathy was curative. It was one of the three core conditions that he posited um, is sufficient for change. And, and it was very, and in humanistic approaches, empathy, and in some of the even psychodynamic approaches, empathy is seen as, it is, it is the process by which, it, it's a it, primary intervention. It is the process by which people change. But that's not how it's seen in CBT. In CBT, it's a technique develop, to develop a relationship so clients will trust the therapist enough in order to follow the recommendations and the cognitive behavioral techniques are what actually create the change. And empathy is not a technique for addressing and changing issues related to the, pro um, the presenting problem. So I think it's important to keep some of that uh, clear. The other thing that is unique and really not a bad idea in uh, CBFTs is the idea of uh, written contracts. And not all, but certainly it's within the um, norm of a CBFT a therapist to write out a written contract, approximately how many sessions, these are our goals, and um, and they, this is seen as a way to help get clients motivated and their buy-in into the process. So now I want to move on to talk a little bit about case conceptualization for CBFT, and there certainly are many different kind of variations and, and um, approaches, and so this is kind of an overview of the more basic processes. So CBFT therapists really focus on defining the present the problem in behavioral terms and so that it can be targeted for treatment and intervention. So one of the first things that will be done often um, for like child behaviors uh, called an assessment of baseline functioning where you look at, you know, how often does a behavior occur? You know, when does it occur? Where does it occur? Who is involved? What happens before? What happens often? What's the severity of it? So depending on the symptoms, you know, you might uh, gather various forms of information. But again, you're looking for the problem behavior, you know, how frequent and severe um, it is, as well as the, you know, an antecedent con consequences of what's happening before. And if it's couple or family specific related, you're looking at who's involved in that dynamic also which gets us to this functional analysis and uh, analysis of mutually reinforcing behaviors. So what is unique in CBFT is this functional analysis where they be um where they spend quite a bit of time kind of working to identify especially if it's a couple or family interaction problem. So when you know the child has a tantrum, how does mom respond? How does dad respond? How do other children respond, you know, behaviorally? And, and so you'd kind of map out that interaction cycle and, the, you know, tantrum first gets bad, dad tries to ignore, you know, mom tries to soothe, and as it escalates, you know, mom gets more frustrated, then dad gets angry and steps in. Meanwhile, the other siblings have retreated to their, you know, room. So you'd get this whole um, behavioral kind of mapping of the interactional uh, interventions. And then you'd also, if you're using a more cognitive version of this, you can go back and kind of map over what were the cognitions. So mom, what were you feeling when you started soothing, you know, the son and maybe identifying some of the core beliefs underneath that. And dad, what were you thinking when you heard that, you know, and if the kid's old enough, what's going on with the kid? And so you would basically also, you can do this exact same process mapping, um, around the interactional sequence and the problem, you know, interactional cycle using, you know, both cognitive and or behavioral assessments of that. And this is really what sets it apart from other approaches. Uh, but even if you're working with an individual, this is so invaluable. And in my textbooks, I do have all the questions you can ask to uh, actually do this and understand how it works. There is, of course, the classic Alice's ABC theory uh, that talks about how, you know, there's A, which is the activating event, 
you know, my partner doesn't show up on time for dinner. And then there's C, the consequence. You know, I'm angry, I'm hurt, whatever it might be. And we have a nice big fight during our, what was supposed to be a romantic dinner. You know, and then there's, and then you go back and identify the B, which is the belief. And so what is the belief uh, that mediated the reaction? So, you know, if my husband really loved me, he would be on time. If I was really a priority in his life, he would make me the priority rather than work is our, our always a priority or, you know, whatever it is. And so then you would um, step back and have the couple, you know, analyze that. And you go back and, um, you know, look at, you know, the husband's reaction in this particular example I've given you, you know, in terms of the activating event is I finally make it to dinner. My mom, you know, you know, my wife is yelling at me because I'm 15 minutes late, you know, and so the his behavior, resulting behavior is either anger, frustration, withdrawal, stonewalling, whatever it might be. And then you can look at his mediating belief, you know, what, you know, um, you know, which might be no matter what I do, I'm never good enough for her. So then you'd, you know, have them explore that. So you would use the same type of analysis you do with individuals. You can do it at the family level. Um, another thing that could be, another piece is the, of an analysis or case conceptualization is looking at the family schemas and core beliefs. And oftentimes this can come from cultural uh, sources as well as individual sources. So... Um, it can be an ethnic culture, it can be the region in which they live, it can be related to social economic status in terms of what some of these schemas are. Often family of origins are the ones who, you know, give us lots of schemas to work with. Um, but some of these are things such as mind reading, mislabeling, dichotomous thinking, personalizing everything, overgeneralizing, you know, what family members your partner does, magn magnification. So you can, uh, as a therapist, can work to identify those family schemas that are keeping them stuck. And then with couples in particular, you can look, they have some examples here of um, typical, typical types of cognitions that are problematic for couples. So selective perception, focusing on, you know, just certain things, not, you know, getting the whole picture. You know, attributions, falsely, you know, attributing various characteristics or unfairly. Um, Attributing characteristics, expectancies, having certain expectations, assumptions, so making assumptions about the partner's intentions or such, and also having certain standards. So these are some of the ways that the CBFT therapist will go in and define the problem in very behavioral, measurable, you know, concrete terms so that there is then something to target for change. So now we're going to move on to talk about the specific ways that CBFT therapists uh, target change. So in terms of uh, CBFT goals, they are uh, they tend to be or they tend to be they are usually behaviorable and measurable. So reduce tantrums to no more than one mild episode per week. And actually, most um, county treatment plans that you will see will have basically, you know, behavioral or, you know, cognitive behavioral goals, these very measurable uh, and behavioral goals. Uh, they want the goals to be agreeable, so they use to help a buy, to get buy-in from everybody. So it's important that, the you know, even in cognitive behavioral, but it's, uh, family therapy, that they're, the therapist gets the buy-in from, the, you know, the, all members of the couple or family. And then finally, uh, what CBFT therapists do that is different often than many other therapists is they really obtain an explicit commitment from the couple or family to complete the th therapy assignments. And like I said, they'll often have a written contract for doing that. And so they actually are very, uh, they're very, uh, very direct and clear about wanting the commitment and buy-in of the client. So CBFT has a lot of interventions and very specific ways to treat certain uh, types of problems. And so we're going to go through some of these, but the list really is infinite um, depending on the presenting problem. So if you like interventions, this is a great approach for you. So the first uh, intervention I just want to start with was one of the oldest ones in the field is classical conditioning that comes straight out of Pavlov's dogs experiments at most most people listening to this probably know about Pavlov, Pavlov and his dogs. And so basically it's a, it's a process of behavioral pairing where you have something like food, which is the unconditioned stimulus, a natural state of affairs, um, which is natu you know, which you naturally paired with 
salivation, which is again the unconditioned response. And then what you do is you begin to pair the unconditional with the conditioned response. So you have the food, which you're going to pair with the bell, which leads to salivation. And so eventually then you can just delete the food and the bell will bring on the salivation. And so actually I use these concepts to create a lot of good habits. Um, I teach mindfulness and so one of the things I, I say is use use this principle of classical conditioning to get yourself in the habit of meditating every day. You know, either like after you shower, before bed, before you start work, before you open your emails, whatever that is. And sometimes also with families or couples, um, I talk about using this principle, especially I use it a lot to introduce positive, you know, family habits. And so one that's almost many families actually have by default is like saying grace before dinner and such and that's a family ritual that can um, actually there's a lot of research that shows that that is a very helpful thing and so you can look at uh, activities like that for couples or families to actually pair you know desired behaviors. Now operant conditioning um, the Skinner cat experiments if you remember those this is really what modern parent training still is kind of the rock bed foundation of it and this is when you are shaping by giving small successive rewards um, so for example in the beginning you might uh, your kid might come home and you know you kind of micromanage when and how their homework gets done but then you might you know begin to give them more responsibility for various parts of it maybe first setting it up maybe you know then maybe doing a page by themselves and you're you're going to shape it by rewarding and you know, allowing them to develop competency and confidence and letting you know this you know this one behavior become normal before you know moving on to the next one and so this is used a lot i would say in um, parenting especially uh, from 2 to 12 you'll see a lot of this operant conditioning and so when you get into different parenting programs there's just so many options but they're all just variations on a theme typically of operant conditioning or at least a portion of the parenting programs are um, so some of the basic principles here is positive reinforcement or rewarding so that's basically you're rewarding them for desired behavior a very common parenting strategy strategy e.g. a treat you know so um, but you want to be careful because if this if this is the only thing a parent is doing then you um, will talk about quid pro quo in a quid pro quo in a moment but the child begins to get the idea that to just do the basics that they're expected to do they should be rewarded for that and, and so oftentimes you kind of create a sense of entitlement and this can lose its appeal if it's used too often and too frequently so you do need to be careful and then there's the whole issue of sugar for the, the treat and how that all plays out so then there's negative re, uh, reinforcement which re, uh, which rewards desired behaviors by removing something undesirable and so again this is still um, so you, here you're relaxing curfew so most people will kind of see that still as a reward but technically in this world of behaviorism it is a negative reinforcement so then positive punishment is uh, reduces an undesirable behavior by adding something undesirable such as assigning you know an extra chore to be done the five minute work chore and then a negative punishment it reduces undesirable behaviors by removing something else that's grounding and so I think it's important to be aware of all of these because it's good to have some kind of combination and my basic uh, philosophy is for the new behaviors you're trying to shape I, I use the um, more positive you know reinforcement you know and or negative reinforcement or um, but for the behaviors that I think a kid is developmentally uh, appropriate they've mastered them you know the kid can do it and they're not doing it that's when you might do more of the punishment and so you know and each kid is different each parents different you know there's a lot there's a lot to consider but that, that's a good general um, guideline I use okay so the frequency of reinforcement and punishment is key 
So immediacy. So the more immediate the reinforcement or punishment, the quicker they're learning. And this is especially true for younger children. And if you're dealing with little ones, little, little ones from, you know, two to three or sometimes even four, it almost has to be immediate or it's pointless. So don't do it. Um, so the immediacy is essential. And again, that'll vary with the kid. You know, the older the kid gets, the more coherent their memory, the, the further from the act that the punishment can be. Like a teenager will get. If a parent finds out a week later that something went down, a teenager gets, yeah. Now they're going to learn still. But a kid who's even six or seven or eight, often it, it, it's not going to actually have the learning you hope for. So as close as possible, as media as possible, consistent. The more consistent, the quicker the learning. And so the consistency is very, um, is very, very important. And like I said, it's where a lot of parents fall short. And in the real world of parenting, um, it is, it's near impossible to be perfectly consistent, but I do expect my, you know, therapists and trainees to, um, to be perfectly consistent in therapy because we can do it there. It's just one of us, one of them, you know, consistency should be, you know, absolutely precise. But at home, it's not going to always be 100%, but especially with certain kids with certain personalities, it needs to be darn near there. And so I, with most of my parents, I look at what's keeping them from being consistent. Often it is having too many battle lines. And if you, if a parent does not have behavioral control over their child, which means 80 to 90% you can manage their behaviors using your words, um, then typically there's a problem with consistency. So one is there's just way too many battle lines out there um, that there's no way that they can manage them all. And so sometimes you just have to say, you know, uh, pick what your battle line is. And so, for example, I mean, this week I had a parent in, and it's like, you know, respectful responses is my number one, you know, issue. Then I'm like, that's your battle line. And so you're not going to focus on making the bed and picking up the floor. You don't, ha the, the, they didn't have the leverage to do that. There's a, you know, high conflict divorce system, a, 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 you know, situation. I said, right now, focus on the respect. When we get that down, then we'll move on to, the, you know, picking up the room and such. But I mean, the consistency is essential, and that's where you'll do a functional analysis to get a sense of why isn't the child learning from the consistency. And then finally, we have intermittent reinforcement, which is random positive reinforcement of a well-established behavior helps sustain them. So what this is for, this intermittent reinforcement, um, sustains either bad behavior or good behavior. So if you're inconsistent in your reinforcement of a child's bad behavior, it's going to continue, okay? So I tell my parents, either don't do any reinforcement or be consistent. But intermittent, you're just going to have more of that problem behavior. Um, but for positive behavior, such as, you know, good grades, random reinforcement of that actually sustains it. So, you know, randomly pick your kid up from school who tends to get good grades and do their homework without too much of your help. Pick them up from school and reward them with something that they, they like on a very random, unpredictable basis. And that helps uh, sustain those behaviors. So encouragement and compliments. So it's so important because often by the time parents are in a therapist's office for help with child behaviors, they have, they're angry. They ha don't have a lot of hope. They've developed a very negative view of their child. And so it's really important um, to help the parents learn how to be encouraging and use lots of compliments um, whenever the kids are doing the, the desired behaviors. And so this certainly will help reinforce it, and it's a very, very easy, important way. And it also helps strengthen the, the relationship, but, you know, and the, um, the sense of the child feeling safe and trusting the parent again. So this is very important to use. So as we mentioned earlier, contingency con contracting is used quite a bit um, with parenting in terms of, you know, if the kid does this, they get that. So... And often this is uh, used to show how de uh, to talk about how details will be earned and lost, and how details, how privileges will be uh, earned and lost. So, for example, if you keep your GPA above three three point oh, you know you can stay out later on Friday, you know later curfew on Friday and Saturday. And ideally, you want to have these be as natural um, of consequences as possible. 
Point charts and token economies. These are typically used with kids of elementary school age, and this is where there's either a point system or sometimes there's literally a token system because it helps to often to be able to see and touch and feel what they're earning. But they will earn points and or literal tokens towards that allow them to get a particular a reward of some kind. And that can be a privilege or it can be an object or something that they want. You see this used a lot in classrooms, which they may need, you know, earning stickers or pencils or, you know, things like that, where, you know, they can also be earning privileges. So, and that what's nice about these is that you can um, do both rewards and punishment within the same system. So good behavior gets you rewards, gets you more points and bad behavior, you lose those. So they can see uh, how those two are correlated. So uh, behavior exchange or quid pro quo arrangements are mutual kind of behavior exchanges. And so this is where, well, if you make dinner, I'll do the dishes. And, you know, and so this is something, I mean, there's a certain innate you know, this makes sense, it seems logical, and it certainly can be useful at times, but you want to be careful with this, especially with couples, but even with parents and kids, where you want this, you don't want to overdo it, because there are a lot of couple, you know, um, problems where they may complain there's not a particular behavior, but overusing this can often backfire both with families and with couples, so it's something to just keep in mind. And so, um, and so yes, and you also want to focus focus this on what you're going to be giving, versus um, what, what each partner might be giving something. So you know you might say, so is there something over the next week you are willing to do, rather than having you know the opposite partner ask or kind of do a demanding uh, request. So um, so this is quid pro quo, and there is definitely a place, but it certainly you know is is should not be the standalone invention intervention for either a family or a couple. So communication uh, and training and problem solving. This is something um, that is used quite a bit. You'll hear about There's some controversy um, around this because there is there is some research that shows that it doesn't make a difference. Um, there's other research that shows that it does. Depends who you want to cite and how it's being used. But it's something actually a fair number of clients will request. And so, and it's something that comes out of this tradition of kind of educating clients and how to communicate better is the idea. So there's a, um, there are a lot of different approaches. Uh, most of them, you know, ad address um, some of these points here in terms of, you know, beginning with the positive, what you appreciate, you know, sticking to a single subject rather than, you know, bringing in all the other past times that this, you know, sin has been committed in this relationship, um, being very specific and having, um, and focusing on the behavioral aspect rather than the emotional, you know, I know that, you know, you don't respect me and that's why you do blah, 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 or what you don't love me. So when you come in the door, you don't get, you know, hug and give me a kiss. So let's separate that interpretation from the behavior. Um, you know, describe the impact. So, you know, when you don't get, you know, kiss and hug me, when you walk in the door, I, you know, I feel distant from you. Um, it makes me feel like you don't love me. It makes me want to be, you know, less loving in return, be more cautious, you know, take responsibility for your half, um, helping them learn how to paraphrase to, sh you know, show that they understand, uh, you know, highlighting, avoiding mind reading, a very favorite thing in couples and families, and to be very clear as to what constitutes verbal abuse and what doesn't, and to make sure that that's, you know, disallowed in the relationship. So there are many approaches to this. There's, you know, some debate as to how effective and useful it is. Um, but it is an intervention with, commonly used in cognitive behavioral family therapy. So in general, psychoeducation, you know, there are, we've talked about various forms of it already, but psychoeducation is a very frequently used technique in cognitive behavioral family therapy. And this is where you are teaching clients, you know, either about psychological or relational principles and how to use this knowledge to e either, quite frankly, sometimes it ends up reframing things, but often for the purposes of uh, CBFT is that typically then you're going to teach them how to use this knowledge in a very specific way to improve their relationship, address the problem. So you can have a psychoed that's very much um, focused on the problem and it can be understanding, you know, a diagnosis or understanding their conflict 
helping them, you know, to understand the assessment essentially of what's going on. The psycho way to be very change oriented. What do we need to do to fix this? You can, bibliotherapy is a very fancy word for, you know, recommending books for them to read. And typically these are going to be on the more educational side. Um, rather than a novel of some kind, although there are some therapists who do this, but in CBFT it's definitely going to be much more along the lines of a cognitive-based self-help book. And then cinema therapy is actually referring clients to watch a particular movie um, to, uh, to get whatever benefit the therapist thinks will be beneficial. So the thing to remember about psychoeducation is not to do too much in a single session. I always recommend like, you know, two minutes for most clients and spending the rest of the, rest of the session talking about how to implement that two minute, you know, sound bite of information into real life, you know, change over the next week. I mean, that's what CBT is about. So it's tempting sometimes to go on like it's a graduate school lecture and cram them, you know, full of, you know, all the, let's just say, you know, Gottman's, you know, seven principles, you know, make marriage work, you, you know, cramming that into one session. It's tempting sometimes for a therapist who can digest all that, but most of our clients cannot. I mean, there are some clients who, who might be able to benefit, but in the large majority, one little, you know, one little principle or piece of, you know, psychoeducation and then really carefully translating that to their life and then how is that going to look over the next week or whatever it might be. So uh, another technique is challenging your rational beliefs and this, you know, comes out of the cognitive therapy tradition. So one, there are, there's a style where you directly confront, you know, an irrational belief such as, you know, my child, sh you know, should, you know, listen to me better, whatever that might be. Or it can be indirect con confrontation using lots of questions, you know. When you were, you know, six years old, you know, do you remember how you responded? You know, so asking questions to get them to see that um, their belief and their expectation uh, is not realistic. And let me tell you, most of us do not have... Uh, r realistic expectations for our partners and children and, and usually more than one area. So this is something that would be con you know, frequently used. Um, and, and I would consider psychoeducation a form of direct confrontation. So you could use psychoeducation about developmental norms. Uh, as it, you know, it's, is a form, can be a form of confrontation to the parent to say, you know, expecting your six-year-old um, to be able to do X, Y, and Z is not realistic. And so that's another, that is a form of confrontation that would be fairly common in couple family therapy. So the Socratic method and guided discovery is, uses inductive reasoning to gently kind of encourage the client to question their own beliefs. And so again, it's a type of indirect confrontation in a way. And so this is, you know, questions like what evidence do you have to support your belief? What evidence to the contrary? What might be realistic middle ground? What does person, you know, A, B, or C have to say about this? If your child were to say the same thing, how would you respond? So using that, those sorts of uh, gentle questions to get the client to, to rethink and, and, um, and look at the kind of logic that may not be so logic under, logical underneath their position or their fear or their emotions or whatever the presenting problem might be. So thought records are typically used in more indi uh, with individuals, but it could also be used um, with a couple or family, probably more of a couple, in terms of the type of st structured journaling approach where you analyze the, um, you know, ir illogical thoughts that are kind of fueling the problem. So it might include something like, you know, looking at the trigger situation, what were your automatic or negative thoughts, your emotional response, the evidence for and against those looking for any cognitive distortions, and then trying to find a more realistic alternative thought. And so this would be something um, that would be, you know, could be used with couples in particular at looking at where they might get stuck uh, in terms of how they respond to their partner. And you could take a, an argument that happened and use this for both of them to help um, look at, you know, where each of them kind of got off and to identify some of the problematic beliefs that they're having that are getting, that are, that are related to the presenting problem. So one thing uh, CBFT therapists do a lot of is, is assign homework between sessions. 
And these homeworks are directly and logically related to the client's problems. And the clients really are kind of expected to do the tasks, and that's what that initial contract often addresses. And so, you know, it could be doing these thought records, it could be practicing the communication skills, whatever it might be, but the homework tasks are very frequently assigned as a part of CBFT. So now I want to talk a little bit about the mindfulness-based and mindfulness-informed therapies for the couple and couples and families. So I just want to focus on a few key um, points and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the approaches and we'll just touch on it because of course there could be a whole lecture, multiple day seminars on mindfulness. But in a nutshell, um, mindfulness is the intentional, on purpose focusing on on a single present moment experience without judgment using compassion and acceptance. And so it's very much paying on t attention on purpose to what's going on in the present moment. Um, it involves acceptance is really key to this is that whatever arises in consciousness, whether you're focusing on your breath um, and you have intrusive, you know, your thoughts, not intrusive thoughts, but all thoughts in some ways are intrusive when you're mind doing mindfulness, but when you um, have thoughts kind of, uh, your mind wanders off to these various distracting thoughts, when you bring back your attention, the point is to not be judging yourself for not being able to focus for more than five seconds, which is pretty much normal, and instead to be compassionate and accepting of this is what is, to be accepting of how your, your mind works. And it's a very power it may um it's a very powerful and over time that ability to accept whatever arises in your consciousness it doesn't mean you like it or embrace it or want to stand behind it or want to say yep that's gonna i'm gonna feel that way for the rest of my life about this situation but you accept that that is part of what you are because um many 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 uh therapists psychologists theologians philosophers over the year over the decades and centuries has have proposed that the, most of our psychological difficulties come from trying to avoid thoughts or feelings that we find overwhelming or disturbing. And so this ability to develop radical acceptance of whatever arises becomes profound when you're able to develop that. And then when we translate that to the work of couples and families, well, I mean, being able to accept your partner and your children and your parents the way they are is huge. And that doesn't mean you accept abuse. Sometimes the acceptance means, oh my God, this person who I love so much, who can make me so happy, take me to the moon and back, also beats me or is also verbally abusive. And that's the reality that it's one person with this heaven and hell experience. And that is a form of how acceptance um, plays out in couple family therapy. So, but the acceptance piece is very, very important as well as this compassion piece. And that's learning, you know, as you practice mindfulness on your own, uh, with your own mind and, and typically in a form of breath meditation, that you develop compassion all, also. And there is specific compassion meditations that are done too. And that this compassion work, making one compassionate for oneself and others, is very, very powerful. And as you can imagine, again, with couples and families, this is key. And so mindfulness, uh, in that it, it is a practice when done, I think as intended, it's fair to say, that it should significantly increase a person's sense of uh, acceptance and compassion. And the research is very clear that mind, those who practice mindfulness on a regular basis are happier in their relationships. They are more compassionate. They're able to accept their partner, partners and who they are better. Um, and so the, this technique is, is very new in the area of couple family th therapy, but it is very exciting. Another thing that happens is that there is this shift in the relationship to the problem. And so part of what happens through mindfulness is you began to develop this observer um, relationship to your own mind, your own thoughts, your own feelings, your own behaviors. And that distance that one can develop through this practice can be very profound. And so a lot of what happens is you begin to shift um, your relationship to the problem. And finally, a thing to note is that Buddhism and so in a uh, Family therapy has a lot of overlays because both of them are very constructivist, both the systemic and postmodern versions of family therapy as well as the Buddhist approach. And so there are a lot of connections that have made, been made in that area too. And it just makes sense when you're working with relationships. There's more than one reality there. 
And um, the mindfulness principles work with that very well. So I just want to take a moment to talk a little bit about some of the more prominent mindfulness approaches. Well, first, there's an important distinction between mindfulness-based and mindfulness-informed. So mindfulness-based therapies are those that have are based on this eight-week, um, what's called MBSR program, which is Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, developed by John Kabat-Zinn at the University of Massachusetts. And so this is the original. I'm saying it's got to be coming up in 40 years, where most of the research has been done on MBSR. Um, and so it's an eight-week uh, program where clients do a significant amount of meditating, you know, 20 to 20 minutes a day outside of the sessions. And But this is probably the premiere, the original, you know, gold standard. And multiple, multiple uh, mindfulness-based classes have been developed off of this one, including one for couples, including some for parents, including some for depression and depression relapse. But this is kind of the original MBSR. So mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is based on the MBSR program, but specifically targets depression and depression relapse, which is a very um, high, there's 50% relapse of, um, with, depressed with depressed patients within a year. Very high relapse. And C, uh, MBCT has really become the gold standard for um, preventing depression relapse. And so as you can see here, again, it's an eight-session model, but it focuses specifically on, you know, looking at what's going on in autopilot in our brains, dealing with the barriers, using mindfulness of the breath, working on staying present, allowing and letting uh, things, uh, allowing letting be, looking at what thoughts are and not considering them facts. So, and so this is a wonderful program to become familiar with because virtually anyone listening to this will be working with people who have um, major depression and relapse with major depression and this is really considered the best treatment at this point in time. I also wanted to briefly mention dialectical behavior therapy, which is a mindfulness-informed therapy, whereas the mindfulness-based therapies are teaching people to basically practice mindfulness um, practices. Uh, this is, DBT looks like normal therapy, it's a therapist talking to a client in the room, but instead, it, but many of the mindfulness practices or concepts are integrated into the, into the work. And so DBT uses mindfulness as really its core skill. And as you probably know, that it, DBT was developed for working with borderline personality disorder, a very difficult uh, condition to work with, and one that does actually have a lot of relational uh, problems associated it, with it, and so difficult relationships. And so mindfulness is used as a core skill in this, teaching the clients to learn how to observe their mind, observe their thoughts, observe their emotions. Just because you're having a thought or emotion doesn't mean it's true, doesn't need to mean you need to believe it or attach yourself to it or react to it. And so they use that. And they also talk a lot about the dialectical tensions um, between two polar opposites. There's a lot of black and white thinking in this approach. In the, in the borderline personality, and so they use the concept of dialectic to help them um, resolve some of that black and white thinking. And again, mindfulness is very useful for that. So another um, mindfulness-informed therapy, so that again, that's two people talking in a room using mindfulness concepts, such as acceptance and compassion, to inform the therapy, is ACT. I still cannot help but pronounce it ACT. I pronounced it wrong for years and I still pronounce it wrong most of the time. But maybe you will remember to say ACT. Uh, so this is it uses a lot about ACT. It never actually uses the term mindfulness, but clearly those concepts are in there and the, the developers, you know, are aware that they're in there and they did that intentionally. But they look. it looks at how um, we construct our reality through language um, in terms of shaping our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And it looks at how we attempt to control our thoughts and feelings, and then also the direct avoidance, the avoidance of direct experience, which I mentioned earlier. So many theories eventually go back to the reason psychopathology and relational problems develop is because we're trying to avoid what is. And so um, the basic process here is, you know, accept and embrace difficult thoughts and feelings, choose and commit to a life direction that reflects who you really want to be, and then taking steps in this direction. And there is there are ACT programs for working with couples specifically. 
So in terms of mindfulness and couple and family therapy, um, there is a mindfulness-based uh, relationship enhancement program. So that is a program for non-distressed couples, couples who are not in conflict and ready to get divorced or somewhere close to that. And so these are for ha relatively happy couples who want to get happier or keep their relationship strong. And, and so it's, it's based on the MBSR program, eight weeks again, and it uses more compassion meditation than the mindfulness uh, focusing on the breath. And so it much more directly focuses on cultivating that. Um, using mindfulness with couples can be helpful generally um, because mindfulness practice in general is associated with a lot of positive relationship benefits such as you know happier marriages, lower emotional um, distress, and better communication. Lots of good things happen. But you wouldn't start with a high conflict couple. You know, so let's go, why don't you guys go home and just meditate? together because that's likely to actually cause more conflict. Um, with families, there's a, there are several mindfulness-based parenting programs and each one kind of focuses on being mindful in a different way, which is interesting. For example, some focus on being mindful about the interaction pattern. Some have the parents work on using mindfulness um, to help them get clearer in terms of uh, you know managing their stress better so that they respond better. So um, mindfulness has been added to several different types of um, parenting, and obviously for anyone I get obvious for anyone who's maybe had a, you know, gone through childbirth, that there's uh, mindfulness is is, very, is used uh, in childbirthing classes and early parenting in that first year also. So uh, in closing, I want to talk a little bit about the research and diversity. So. Cognitive behavioral therapy in general is a, in many ways is a research-based um, psychotherapy and, and it, you know, across the board, CBFT certainly has the most, the largest volume of research. It isn't always superior to other approaches for every single thing out there, but they certainly have the greatest volume and the most developed and the most sophisticated um, research in many cases, not all cases, I guess, but it's certainly, they're um, one of the best researched approaches. Um, and CBFT ther uh, theorists, uh, you know, are no different from that. In fact, um, I think very admirable Neil Jacobson um, reformulated his whole behavioral couples therapy to include a more cognitive aspect to develop this integrative behavioral couples therapy, now one of the leading evidence-based treatments um, by Andy Christensen. UCLA has kind of further developed this, but you know they used research that showed that the behavioral therapy was effective, but it d didn't have long-lasting effects. And so they went back, they reformulated, they added this acceptance piece and this integrative behavioral therapy um, piece, and so it, it has better long-term effectiveness now. And so they're very, uh, and that's just how CBT works, and that is why it is highly regarded within the field. And they certainly. Um, when you go to the list of you know recognized evidence-based treatments, they dominate CBFTs, uh, CBTs in general, dominate the list, and that's also true within the couple and family worlds also. And lastly, I want to talk a little bit about diversity. So CBT is an approach that should be used, uh, that has been used widely with diverse clients, um, both in terms of ethnic diversity as well as you know sexual identity diversity. But you do need to be careful in that because you know you it is a, a an approach that allows a therapist to take the role as an expert to um, use education um, with clients and to really rely on that. Um, there can be problems, as well as strengths, when working uh, cross-culturally. So one thing to think about is, you know, in terms of how your particular client, given their diversity factors, may respond. There are certain populations that appreciate the expert role and respond well to it. They expect, you know, a mental health professional or any type of medical professional to be an expert. That kind of goes, that's what they're expecting based on their cultural background. And they're more comfortable with that. They're more comfortable with that distance, and it feels right. And so um, that's one thing. The, but there are other people, or other cultures, and other you know diversity factors that may make that more difficult. Um, and then also looking at you know the hierarchical difference again, based on the client's you know ethnic background, cultural background, it may or may not, and gender differences. That expert role may or may not be uh, received warmly, shall we say. So it's, it's something to actually sit down and think about. The other piece is, if you're working cross-culturally, 
or working with diverse clients to be very aware about um, whether or not the uh, psychoeducation you have to provide and is based on research that is appropriate for the clients that you're working with. Um, for example, if you're working um, with a same-sex couple and providing psychoeducation that's really based on you know, heterosexist research or norms, you need that, that should not be done. So you need to really be sensitive in that way and make sure you do your homework if you're going to be providing psych, uh, psychoeducation with diverse clients. You know, that said, there have been specific approaches and recommendations made for using CS, uh, CBT with a wide range of ethnic groups and other diverse groups, including uh, sexual um, identity issues and so and sexual orientation. So you, I encourage you, if you're going to use this approach and working with specific groups, you know, how to, uh, to, to do some reading on how to use this approach and make sure the psychoeducation as well as the level of hierarchy and expertise that you assume is a good fit for the clients that you're working with. So and just in uh, wrapping up here, cognitive behavioral couple and family therapies are certainly prominent in the field. And they, they, they're very similar to what we're used to in more traditional forms, but they really add that piece of analyzing the interactional behavioral patterns between the couple or the family or the, whatever relationships um, are significant in the client's life. And whether or not you're working with an individual couple or family, that analysis of that dynamic I think you're going to find very, very useful. The other piece in here is is the parent education and you'll probably find at some point in your career that this is you know really essential in helping parents manage children's behavior and every child you know is different every parent's different and different styles of parenting work with different children even within the same household and so there's a lot in this CBT approach that you will find CBFT excuse me approach that you will find helpful in working with parents um, as well as couples and individuals. So I hope you found this as a useful introduction to CBFT and I encourage you to read further both in my books and widely in the field.